one of our great Canadian filmmakers, Alan Moyle, who made a movie in the Maritimes. I don't know whether it was New Brunswick. Um, well, you'll look him up. Uh, New Bedford Girl, is that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that was his movie. That was in Nova Scotia, wasn't it? Yeah, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia New yeah, it was Bedford, then, yeah, it'd be Bedford, Nova Scotia, yeah. 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 Anyway, it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of heart. And uh, so he had a loft on St. Lauren, uh, on, on the main, on, on the Deuce, 42nd Street. And it was upstairs from a strip club, a porn club. And uh, it was great. So we were there a lot. One, one Canadians on the Deuce. So now when you see that HBO thing, you're going to say, well, gee, I wonder which one of those people is Canadian. <laughs> so in those days, um, the alacrity of execution uh, bypassed uh, the editor's office. You guys are journalist people, you know. You don't get a chance to publish anything unless it goes through proper channels. Well, the wonderful thing about being an artist is, yes, there are curatorial considerations, but that, if you've uh, overreached, you can always put it in a drawer for later times or, you know, for your trial to say, I didn't really mean it. So, um, <laughs> But that's true. Artists create 20 works, they show two, three, four, five, exactly. something like that. I've never heard of any artist that shows more than 50% of the work. You know, oh. you know, if that well, the, up. some of them do, unfortunately. Um, Unless know. it's some sort of particular narrow field of endeavor. Right, narrow or empowered by finances. Yeah. Anyway, so another uh, instantaneous uh, way of working is paint in crayon form. So these are the oil sticks, two of the oil sticks. Oh. I had a show of them recently, and I stopped using them in around 1992. Their crudeness, uh, you know, wasn't up to what was becoming my newer standard, which was something a little more real and at the same time more vaporous, more disappearing, something that you can't put your hands around, and it had the melancholy of uh, our transcending times. So one of the uh, critics accused me, uh, only because I empowered him to accuse me, uh, of being nostalgic in my uh, treatment of the automobile oh. in my work. So he accused me of being nostalgic. And I thought about that, and, and then I applied, I haven't written to him uh, as, as a rebuttal, but I think any time anyone paints the contemporary environment, it really is an anticipation of nostalgia because our rate of change is so fast that whatever you do, and if you look at all the hipsters that are in the indie bands and things like that, what's on their t-shirts? Cartoons that they watched when they were five years old. So we're having our culture constantly being removed by economic and entertainment considerations because you have to keep on changing the cat litter and uh, otherwise you're so there we go rotating the fancy feast i don't know how many i have here that are uh, actual reverential car moments but we'll see we'll see what i can find i know this one is this is a beauty yeah. So, and that's. But what uh, this started? These car paintings started in, a, in an unusual way. I was uh, at a party uh, hosted by Tony Shafrazi, I think. He's he's uh, well known for having defaced Guernica at the Modern. In case you want to reference that. Um, anyway, uh, it was an art party, and I met these collectors of mine from Mexico who told me they had bought a slew of art in the East Village and they said, Stephen, your work is the only work that we still have hanging. Two large paintings, one of them was Junkie Bitch After the Shower, a beautiful blonde girl with sunglasses and a towel, and uh, spray paints, day glow, greens and blues behind her, and it's, it's a nice piece, I don't know whether I, is he nodding? You, got, you were up late last night. You're from Montreal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, he, uh, so he asked me, he said he had a son who was having episodes 
and the son was asking him for a Ferrari. Well, you know, anybody who collects art has enough money for a Ferrari, one would assume. And, uh, and so, would I paint him a Ferrari rather than doing one? So I was in love with the Rob Report, which became the DuPont Registry and all those uh, pictures of exotic cars. So I stole a few images and I did a Ferrari, and this isn't a Ferrari, and I started the whole series. But one of them was bought by the Canadian Embassy uh, here in town, uh, or well, probably in Toronto they bought it, but it was in the uh, embassy here in the foyer when the uh, Hanels were in power, George Hanel, he's a business guy from Ottawa. And uh, they've had a huge response in a way, I've only exhibited them as a group twice, you know, group, groupings of like 40. And the goal was in those days, and again, the economics of one's life, you always want to compete with the big guys. And what are the big guys? They're selling a piece like this for 50,000 and up, right? 50,000 would now be cheap. So I wanted to make a $100,000 painting. So I did, one section at a time. And I put them all in a grid. And eventually, they all sold. So I did make my $100,000 painting. We'll go for a little walk around, a walkabout. I have no idea. I think I grabbed the right ones. But I made it wrong. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh. Ah. So you know, just like Conan Doyle, you want to kill your, your heroes. And, uh, So I, I did a grouping, uh, I haven't shown them yet, of uh, burning cars. I've got about 10 of them. Uh, two of them have already sold privately, but, you know, and they, uh, they go nicely horizontally. There's a few more. There are a few stragglers. Yeah, there might be a straggler or two walking in. So. What's that? There might be a few students. Uh, Walk again, staggerers? Yeah. Professors, oh. actually. Yeah. Actually, I wouldn't put two red ones together unless I was doing a red series. You can do that, then you can do that, and then you can shift this puppy down here and have a six pack. So they're modular, you know? Wow, it still is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's a very vivid. I love how the day glow really makes the fire pop. Yeah, I hope it lasts. But even if it doesn't, it'll be a pretty bright <laughs> orange in its deterioration. But you know, one of the tricks, I'll give out my tricks. One of the tricks is to paint. Painting, oil painting, is underpainting. Whatever color informs the surface will make it more interesting. That's why I'm so excited to be doing these collaboration pieces. Is this this is something I'm loving doing. Uh, the uh, tenant I had before was a very wealthy, romantic, fabulously energetic, six foot six, metabolizing at a hundred miles an hour creature who came in and set up speakers, took over the studio and made these abstract paintings that were all over the place to music headphones. He had his cashews all over the place and, and, and uh, painted and listened and all of that. And he changed his mind. I'm going into psychology, I'm going back to college and all of this jazz. And he said, Stephen, I loved it. Of course, I owed lots of money in rent because I was taking his rent and spending it on that fabulous thing we call survival. And, uh, and the two of us came to lots of arrangements. He took paintings of mine and covered the rent. And uh, even though, you know, it, it all worked out, I assume, I never count. And uh, that said, he left me a whole bunch of paintings with permission to paint over them. So I didn't have to do my underpainting. Uh, and I got to paint over and use my strength, uh, he was abstract, my strength of, of <coughs> a, a journalistic and experiential uh, referential to uh, come to these conclusions. And uh, some of them are really delicious. And uh, I'm grateful for the input. And I secretly know that uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, the great revered artist, hired a friend of mine, Rick Prohl, 
to do his underpaintings in his final years when he too was getting tired. We get tired. It happens. But here's another one of Zachary's, and I call them collaboration pieces, and I give him credit. He's happy he doesn't need to have a slice of the pie, and he's just happy to be remembered peeking through the various textures. So that's, uh, that's a bit of me. That sounds great, yeah. Yeah. I have one other aspect. I, I made a memory point of showing you all. You were commenting on color, which we adore color. <laughs> but sometimes it's good to reduce the color. And uh, here's a couple of those. Again, each, each format uh, encourages you to a different palette and content. That's just how we roll. I don't know if you've seen any of these, William. No. But you know. Monochromatic almost. Exactly. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. I, I think I've seen some images of this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, or similar. Yeah. They have their own light. Yeah. And yeah, they they breathe in a very special way. And uh, and a room of them when yeah. you're surrounded by them, boy, it it hits you kind of here. It's a real a visceral body thing. So. There we go. Well, in, in my current class, our yes. intro to Art Fundamental, what was the first project we worked on? Of monochromatic still life. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Morandi. Moran oh, we love Morandi. Yeah. And it's not monochromatic, is it? Morandi's original work is not, but we start with mo just tones. You know? uh -huh. I so yeah, I can, I've never done that, believe it or not. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've done it. I, yeah, you've got I it guess. here. Yeah. It just all happens. Oh yes, I did monochromatic. I did uh, airbrush work using Higgins non-waterproof India ink through the airbrush because waterproof India ink has lacquer in it and that stops up your airbrush. So this was a continual flow and I did freehand drawings, uh, once again referring back to uh, uh, pulp journalism. And, and yellow journalism that had crime scenes and, and lurid aspects of our humanity that had pornographic, uh, you know, overheads. And so that's what I did for about three, four years. And then someone came into the studio and said, it looks like you only paint at night. And I said, well, you're observant. And so I decided, I wonder what the world's like in the morning. And so I started changing my whole life because of that one comment, it happens. Yeah. Officially in Cannes, he was a fan of the two movies, Rubber Gun and Montreal, Maine. He thought, this guy is wild. He's the best actor I've ever seen. This is David Cronenberg. Yeah, he okay. said, this is, this is it. I got to cast him. He's either a great actor or he's a complete maniac. Maniac, bing! So, uh, still, we work twice. Um, and we're still in touch. Um, he's, he's wonderful, he's very bright. I love smart people. Uh, you don't have to finish sentences. It's like, you know, when you play a good game of tennis and the ball isn't hit so far that you can't ever get it back and you get a volley. So it's good, even though he has to win. <laughs> <laughs> He's like that. And, uh, and as for Leonard, Leonard is family, we're related. Um, but we didn't meet until I was like about 22, 21, I don't even remember, but uh, we met when he was being interviewed and, uh, but you, you grew up knowing that he's part of the family yeah. and every aberration you expressed as far as society was concerned or artistic activities, <laughs> you better go downtown and meet your cousin Leonard. So that's what I grew up with and, uh, and eventually we did meet and, uh, and hung out a little bit. Of course, uh, by the time we were hanging out, I was, I'm 12 years younger than him, and so oh, my yeah. crowd of boomer brats riding around on loft floors having wild parties on the main were quite attractive to the uh, older honey liquor. Uh, and so he would come by in those days to uh, 
You see the trade and usually leave humiliated, of course. I <laughs> <laughs> wrote a song about it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, probably. So, you know, uh, and Montreal is romantic that way. Every street corner is a love affair. And, uh, you know, the people are beautiful and accessible. To Toronto is just as erotic, <coughs> but it's under key. You know, I mean, the, the people in Toronto, you always see them buttoning themselves up after the sexual act, whereas in Montreal, <laughs> they're like, oh, hi, I just had one, I'm ready for another. So that's my <laughs> memories of it. Um, you know, and New Brunswick, I have no idea. I only go down there for the poutines. Yeah. <laughs> Poutine rapé, not for the stuff with the cheese on it. But the, real, the real deal, you know? <laughs> anyway, I love the Brunswick. Show in um, Illinois. Yes. At the University of Illinois. Yes, that was terrific. Yeah, that was terrific. That was all car-related imagery. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, now, and, and but you were known for doing cars yeah. before that. The metaphor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cars sort of turned me on to officially turned me on to art because in 1964 I came to the New York World's Fair and the GM exhibit had an abstract Corvette. And that was um, so much like a, a hands art, you know, a morphic thing. And it was white, and it was muscular, and it was it had speed, and it had corporate aggression to it. It was just all of these things were informing this Corvette shape. And I've talked to other people that were overwhelmed by that, and that brought my love for European art into something that I could sink my teeth into. So that was. Uh, by any strange chance, are you familiar with the Aurora Safety Sedan? The Aurora Safety Sedan. The Aurora Safety Sedan, was that an electric vehicle? No, nope, it was a safety car from the 50s. It was designed by a uh, uh, car oh, designer. Not Bud Mr. Fuller. Nope, no. Nope. Virgil Exner? No, nope. but I think it was uh, maybe a student of Virgil Exner's. Okay. Uh, who went on to become a priest, and it was a one off. Uh -huh. and, uh, but it was. Uh, it had a lot of flowy lines to it. Exactly. I'd have to see it. Yeah. I, I probably know it, and typical uh, to me, I only looked at the picture and not the type. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on, uh, on the subject of, of great Canadian art, uh, this uh, here, uh, that, the, the preoccupation with hair, mm -hmm. Tom D. Oh, yeah. did some brilliant pieces with hair. Tom had. Uh, and now I have. Tom used to have shoulder length, almost waist length hair, and he would tie it into a braid. And later on, he went through his uh, changes, did so many, and he cut his hair. Out. And he gave me the pigtail. Oh, he did. The braid. Uh -huh. I have the braid somewhere. It feels like it's alive. I might have given it back to him on request about five years ago, uh, which you know I wouldn't remember. Good. I mean, you know, because things have happened lately, who remembers? But well, these are interesting, I don't know. Uh, 